because you don't understand who we are. The world doesn't understand what a human being is. This is the definition it gives to humanity, but it's not. First, before getting into why we have this distress in us, I want to talk a few slides, maybe three, four slides about who is the source of illness. So St. Basil says, it is fully to believe that God is the author of our sufferings. This blasphemy destroys God's goodness. Illness is not fashioned by the hand of God. God who made the body did not make illness, just as he made the soul, but not by no means made sin. God did not make death. St. John Chrysostom, if you wish to know the state of the body as it left the hands of God, return to paradise, and behold the man whom God had just placed there, his body was not subject to corruption, like a statue taken from the kiln, that shines most brightly, he experienced none of the infirmities that we know in our day. Of course, they're talking about physical and emotional, right? We go back to Genesis 2, 7, and it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Often people think that God created humanity as immortals. But no, we're not created as immortals. We have deep down this desire for immortality, yeah, that's given from God, right? But we are created out of dust, of the ground. Which means, what he just is talking about, is that we as humans, we are susceptible to death, to infirmity, to corruption. That's what he's talking about. But that's not the end of the story. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He gave the Holy Spirit, he gave the soul. He gave a grace that balanced things out. So the human being, in other words, when God created him, he was in a pure state, but his nature was susceptible, susceptible to immortality or mortality. Both of them were there. And it was based on what they would do, right? Whether they would eat of the tree of life or not. Disobey God or not disobey God. So what led, what I'm seeing here is being formed of the dust of the ground makes us susceptible to infirmities. But that's not how God designed us, because he balanced us with his grace. But then St. Theophilus of Antioch says, for the first creature, disobedience, for the first creature, disobedience procured exclusion from paradise. In his disobedience, man acquired fatigue, suffering, and distress. Right? So in the same way, we say God is love, I can say hatred is the lack of love. Some fathers say no, it's a bit more than that, but regardless, right? We have light and darkness, like Abraham was talking about yesterday. So here, if I'm stepping away from God, if I've chosen mortality, then these things come in very naturally because I'm stepping away from the source of life and goodness. St. Irenaeus, because of the sin of disobedience that illnesses torment mankind. So what's the source of illness, of infirmity? distress, whether physical or mental or emotional, is us being away from God. But the idea is, what did God do? I guess I want to touch on that issue, right? Where he became man. He was incarnate. And he was incarnate to give healing to that nature, right? There's a reason why the fully divine being had to take a full humanity is to heal this humanity. And you find that most, not most, but a lot of his work on earth, if you go through the gospel, have to do with him healing people, right? Whether physical, whether spiritual, right? Whether emotional. So that's what God came to do. He came to repair our problem that was caused because of our disobedience. Now, what I want to mainly talk about today is this here. So this here entirely is pretty much a summary of what is required for me as a human today that knows God to remain healthy emotionally, right? And the main one I'll focus on is the awareness of self, the healthy awareness of who I am. And what causes anxiety, depression, is that we don't understand who we are, right? We want to attain a certain level of perfection in the eyes of the world, not in God's eyes. And that makes some sort of of emotional distress within us because we're not wired to be like that. For to me, to know that I'm self, who I am, right, also means that I do have a need, I realize that. 
Because one of the types of not knowing who we really are, like the world, we are taught that we need to be self-sufficient, right? So I need to be, to be myself and I, I can do all things, in other words, right? I can become my own God, that's what the world teaches, in a sense, right? So I have no need anymore. That's not true. If I get to know who I am, then I have a need, right? And all this happens through relationships. Healthy, healing relationships. Because we are Trinitarian beings in the sense we are the mirror of the Holy Trinity. We are relational to others. And we need relationships for us to remain healthy. We cannot do otherwise. And all these are connected and provide the spiritual and psychological health. Because spirit, right, our spiritual life and our emotional life, they're interconnected. They're not the same, right, but they're interconnected, right? So both of them work with each other. For example, if I take someone that's in depression, right, which is a mental illness, right, can a depressed person become a saint? Can? Yeah. He can if he's healed, but as long as he's depressed, he won't be able to. Okay, for example, can a depressed person, if I tell him, yes, get up and go pray, will he be able to get up and pray? Yes? He could be, right? But in reality, in, in general, depression involves someone that thinks he's incapable of doing things, right? So doesn't want relationships, he thinks he's incapable at work, whatever it is, right? So it's not, they, they both affect each other, right? But this is not also from a psychological perspective, also it's very theology. It's all about theology because the awareness of the self, I need to realize that I am in the image of God. And this is big, and I don't think we understand it enough, right? We hear it a lot, but I don't think we get what that is. Also, we need to understand who we are because we are fallen. And I'll get to that later, right? And it involves the Trinitarian being, right? God, right? That he's relational and also we need to be relational. We need to have these healthy healings and I am in need of others. I'm in need of other things that are outside of me, right? So this is a lot of theology at the same time. So the wrong sense of self is this. As I said before, I am in need of stuff. So what happens is you often meet people, right? You want to talk to them. You want to have a personal discussion with them. And then what they talk to you about is their career, right? Their hair, how much they pay at the hair salon, right? How many hours they spend cleaning their shoe, whatever. Like, they talk about their car, their house, their bags, everything. Because they can name it, right? But they actually don't talk about themselves. Who they are. Their personality. Right? So the world teaches us this is our value. My value, apparently, is based on what I own. It's based on stuff, right? And so I want to show off and get the best clothes. If I want to show off and get the best car, and so on and so forth. But that's not where our value is, far from it. It's a completely wrong understanding of who we are. And because we live like this, because we are taught by the world that this is the right thing to do, at the end, you find no fulfillment, no true happiness. Right? Yeah, we have a lot of stuff, and I could be happy with my car for a month, two months, and then there's a scratch on it, and you know, that's it, that's it. I need a bigger car, a better car, and so on and so forth. And you know about all these people commit suicide, I'm not gonna get into this stuff, because but the, the ideal or the reality is, this is not what makes me a human being. In the way I'm created, in the way I am designed, it's not it. And if I follow this, then I have forgotten who I am and these things I am. There's a nice quote that says, people used to love people and use things. Now they love things and use people. Right? Isn't that true? Right? Now I can backstab someone at work, so I use the person right, to get what I want, my desire, a career, an objective. Right? I can use someone to do whatever for me, to serve me, whatever it is, right? But in reality, I just want to use it to get whatever I want, right? This is the mentality of today, based on what we inherit from the world. <laughs> this is obviously a real face, right? I'm sure she walks like that all the time, right? I personally have issues with pictures, but that's just me, okay? In the sense where, if I go on vacation, right? 
let's say I, I want to live my vacations. For example, if I go, I don't know, if I'm here, where I said beautiful water scenery, right? I want to enjoy it, right? I want to live it, right? But many people don't do that. Today, it's like I have to take a billion pictures of it. So we'd rather take pictures all the way, we're not gonna watch them again, we're just gonna post them on Facebook or whatever, right? But we would rather do that and actually live the life, right? Here I have personally, when I see people doing that, not necessarily that picture, but when I see people posing for 15 minutes to take the perfect selfie, right? To put on Facebook or Instagram, I have a problem with that. I don't, have, I don't have a problem with them, but that mentality, I, can't, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Live your life. It doesn't matter. I don't want to know what you have eaten yesterday night. What, don't put pictures <laughs> of your food. I don't care. It's like, this, is, well, this is not real life, right? We are not living a real life. I want you to... This is true. And I can tell you how this is real even when the, it, within the church. I know, I know that the fathers will agree with me. Because you see that all the time. People that come, for example, say, I wish I was that person, right? But they have no idea how the other person is completely broken. But we know. Obviously, we don't say anything. But we know, right? Or someone that comes and says, when I'm so broken and, and you know, confesses all these things and how there's so many problems in the person's life. But half an hour before it, or half an hour later, He's on top of the world on Facebook, right? It's the most beautiful picture. It's like they're, they're, they're there, they're in heaven. People put on masks. They fake things. So there's a wrong idea of what reality is today. And we absorb that wrong idea of reality, and we try to connect with it. But it's not reality. This is fake, right? And it's perfectionism. I need to be perfect, but you're not. How can you be perfect when you're not? So this dichotomy or this distance, this difference creates in us so much distress. I have to attain to that level. I'm not successful if I'm not a doctor, if I'm not a pharmacist, if I'm not an engineer, I'm not successful. If I don't have this car, I, I cannot belong to this group of people. Who cares? What is this? Who, who put in these rules? Right? We don't consider this, right? We just go with it. We don't understand who we really are. Part of it is to understand that we are persons and not individuals. Do you know the difference? Because today, they're both synonymous, right? A person is an individual. But in reality, in theology, they're not. So we never talk about the Trinity. We never gonna talk about the Father as an individual. We say the Father is a person. We'll never hear that. That's heresy. That the Father is an individual, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit. That he's a person. Why is that? What's the difference? Can you? Can I attempt? Can I attempt to help? Yes. Yeah, he, he does after the incarnation, right? That's very true. But prior to it, he did it in a sense, right? But I'm talking now before the incarnation. I'm talking even between the Trinitarian person as that one being, they would call, we still call them persons because the Son was there from the beginning, right? Yes? Um, a person belongs to something, like a community, or in the case of the Trinity, it would belong to the Trinity, where yes. an individual is standalone? Exactly that. A person is someone that fits within a community. So you know when we talk about, in Greek, we, take, we say each person is a hypostasis, right? So that's Greek, which means understate, which means simply uh, put, that each one of the three persons is foundational to the other. So if I give an example, so imagine a triangle, right? The triangle is the Trinitarian God, right? So we have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, so it's one triangle, right? If I remove the Father, right, just this side, or any side for that matter, right? Is the triangle there? No. If I remove the Father, the Trinity is not there. So the Father is foundational to the two others. If I remove the Son, the Trinity is not there. So the Son is foundational to the two others, etc. Right? So a person, and that's what we call each of the, the hypostasis a person, because they live as a community, in a sense. And we are their mirror, right? Or God's mirror, right? 
So we are communal beings, relational beings, right? That's what a person is. But an individual is not like that. An individual says, no, no, I want to be alone. I am self-sufficient, right? I am too independent. I can make it on my own. I'm, I'm God, right? Leave me alone. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. That's where the need for truth comes. And I'm going to my corner and I live my life. Do I reconcile with people? No, I don't need people. Or do I reconcile them with them, right? So loving my enemy makes no sense at this point, right? Or loving anybody for that matter, right? So this is what an individual is. Obviously, we are Trinitarian, we are persons, right? So what I want to speak about, the first thing about the wrong sense of self is too independent. So I want to say to be healthy in that understanding of having the healthy sense of self, it's like a fine line that I need to walk on to remain healthy, emotionally, right? If I am on this side, I am too independent, which I'll explain in a second. If I am on this side, I am too dependent, which is not better either, okay? So too independent means I'm an individual, not a person. So I do not acknowledge God or His commandments first. I don't care about Him. I am God, small g, right? I can do whatever I want, which leads to sin, which leads to suffering, which leads to anxiety and distress and so on, right? Do I do not acknowledge my need for others. But in reality, we all need others, right? Anybody wants to eat alone? Does anybody like to eat alone? Does anybody like to feel rejected? Yeah, you could if you want a time off, right? But generally speaking, nobody wants to be a reject, right? We all have or have this need to love and to be loved, right? So I need to acknowledge my need for others. Someone that does not acknowledge the need of his family and friends, so someone that doesn't, understand his responsibility towards others. So this relationship goes both ways, so right? I have a need for others, they have a need for me, therefore I have a responsibility towards them, right? So we are relational beings, right? This leads to self-absorption and to lack of self-restraint, meaning I go all out, I do whatever I want to do, okay, I commit sin all I want, I don't care about God and so on. I don't care about others, I can back, back them, right, their back. I can do whatever I want to others. I can cheat, right? I can do whatever I want because it's all about me. But that's not who we are. Because we are persons, we are not individuals, right? The other side that is too dependent, right, is when we forget that we are child or children of God. I'm the son and daughter of God. I forget that I'm in his image and I'm working towards his likeness, right? What I mean by that is when I do not value myself, and this is very, very, I don't want to say very common, but it's somewhat common, right? Where everything, who I am, my definition of myself is based on what others think of me, right? So I don't have a persona anymore. Persona is like a personality. I, ha I don't have an identity. I don't have a will. I don't have uh, a need, not a need, but I don't have to comment right, on something because I have no comments, I don't have any comments, right? I'm nobody, in other words, but that's not how God created me. God created me with a persona, a personality, right? an identity, a gift, right? Skills, and He wants me to find them, to use them, to find fulfillment in Him and in working with these gifts. I have an identity, but no, these people don't have that. So. These people are like emotional spikes, right? So at 9 o'clock this morning, I got a nice text saying your picture on Facebook yesterday looked phenomenal, so I'm so happy right now. I'm, I'm on top of the world. At 9.05, I get a text saying you're ugly. And now I'm like all the way down there, right? And at 11, the person apologizes. I'm like, okay, I'm somewhere in between. Like, we're not stable because my value is not there. I think it's not there, although it is there, right? but I base it on what, how others perceive me, which is completely wrong, right? So I'm unable to function on my own, and obviously I can tell you, for example, that there are people that are really mentally sick, like I'm talking now to extremes, are exactly like that, right? They, have, they are so dependent on people, right? And then there's boundaries that need to be discussed, but I'll try to stop it. All the emotions become associated with others, right? So that leads to anxiety, obviously, obviously needs to anxiety and to self hate right? <clears throat> we need to walk on that fine line. So in other words, Philippians 4.13 does not say, I can do all things. I am not too independent. It does not say, I cannot do anything. 
That's not what the Bible says. I am not dependent. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Very different. It's the middle line that I need to walk on, right? Once I walk on it, I'm good. I'm healthy. I know who is it that I am, right? So a healthy sense of self is an independent person, but not independent. He has a capacity to distinguish his identity from others in his environment. He has his persona, he can make decisions, function, right? He has preferences, has opinions, goals, right? He can discuss openly feelings and desires, he has no problem because he knows who he is or she knows who she is. They're confident. There's no problem with that. Okay? Someone that has and assert his or her will. I assert my will. Any person has a will. The definition of a person means will. I have a will. I have an opinion. I have a preference because I'm a person. I have a will. Right? But I have to assert that will. And some of you might be thinking at this point, well, what do you mean? Like yesterday we were saying that to love, I need to submit my will to others, to be sacrificial. But it's very different. When I love others, it's when I know myself, I know who I am, I know that I have a will, and I willingly submit this will for the sake of love towards the other. Here it's not that. Here is someone that says, in a way, I don't have a will. Right? I'm so dependent on you that you become my will. Right? Like I, I need other people, so I, I have no identity. That's not true. That's not Trinitarian. That's not Christian. Right? We are our own person, each one of us. So I have to have my will first, Right? And that's what is being said here, then willingly submit my will. Okay? And that's the difference. So this is not about loving myself, but about understanding myself. I understand myself, I know myself, then I love right? others. Right? Also, we need to know that we are God's children, but we're also fallen. And these two are intertwined together. Right? So there's a beautiful book of written by Abu Nusra Fiyun Bura Musa, it's called Toward Repent. It's a very small book, very beautiful. One of the things is that he says something beautiful that I'll attempt to quote on this, right? So usually what happens is when someone sins, for example, the person sinned. So in his, in his mind, he wants to be perfect, right? I want to love God, oh man, I missed the mark, I have sinned, right? So now the devil comes in, you're no good, right? This is not gonna work, God will not accept you, and so on. And you say, yeah, man, I can't believe I did this. And I start absorbing all these ideas, and I start following and progressing in that sin, and then I go to despair sometimes, but now I'm just exaggerating, right? But I follow and continue following, right? Because we have this idea that we are God's children, but we forget that we are also fallen. So what he says in the book, which I'll paraphrase the quote, he says, if you fall once, this is human, meaning, since I'm human, I'm God's child, and I'm fallen, they're intertwined, so it's something normal, in other words. Do you know a perfect human? No, a perfect human does not exist, right? Other than the locus, right? Does not exist. There's no perfect human. So the understanding that I am also fallen makes me realize, okay, well, this is kind of normal, in a sense. I, I, I got weak at this point. So I need to get up. But he continues and he says, if you fall twice, meaning twice in a row, then this is something devilish. It's very different, right? So I fell once, obviously, it's a, it's a mistake, it's a sin, I need to get up and repent and move on with my life. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying there's, there's no need for repentance, there is a need. But worse than that is to say, oh man, I'm no good, and fall a second time. That becomes devilish. It's not human anymore. It's not natural in our current sense anymore. Right? And then the second time leads to the third one, and so on and so forth. Right? And that leads by to bad things. So this idea, this combination, this interweaving of these two ideas really makes us understand who we are, which brings down the level of anxiety and distress. Right? And this is one like Abra was talking about yesterday, how we need to embrace the pain. King, King David made a huge mistake, right? You all know of it, right? Adultery, murder, you name it. The prophet Nathan came to him, right? King David didn't say, well, you know what? Everybody sins, man, who cares? Whatever, right? I'm the king, I can do whatever. 
He didn't see that. He realized what happened. He was in pain. His child died, right? He was in pain. But he embraced it. He grew out of it. And it's not easy. But it's because he grew out of it that he gave us Psalm 50, Psalm 51, right? Same thing with Job, right? Job had a miserable life at some point. He had a beautiful life, and all of a sudden, everything is crashing, right? He didn't say, well, you know what? I could just marry someone else. I'll have 10 more kids, 20 more kids, 20 more, it doesn't matter. I'll just do whatever that thing, it doesn't matter. No, 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 that's not how it works. I need to embrace the issue, right? Embrace the pain and go out of it. And this is why he got to a point, he said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Like I used to hear of you, but now my eyes sees you. Now my unity with you is very different. Because throughout fallenness of humanity, and our mistakes, we embrace this pain, and then we are glorified with God, right? The healthy sense of need. Again, I'm not going to go much about this because I think it's very obvious, but the one example I'll give you is this, which is, again, very Trinitarian. I heard it in a sermon of a woman, and it was very beautiful. It's an example of uh, us being oranges, right? So before the fall, we are these oranges, but in that bag, right? So we all step to each other, we're a community. We all deal with each other, love each other, submit to each other, so on and so forth. But when the fall happened, it's as if the bag was cut. So imagine that all the oranges are just falling, right? They hit each other, and then they disperse. As they disperse, the distance between the oranges is increasing, so they become individuals rather than persons, right? So I need to understand, that I am in need of people, I'm not perfect, right? If I'm not an organized person, right, I can ask help from someone else that is organized, right? If I'm not a good whatever, someone else is, I ask for his help, and so on and so forth. And that, right, reduces the anxiety and the stress and so on. The understanding of who I am, that I am limited, in other words, I am not God. The last one is the healthy healing relationships. So the wrong sense, Obviously, these were set so I was quickly through them, splitting, and obviously, in love, that's not healthy at all. That's why God asks to reconcile. Dependence, so again, this is too independent. This is dependent, excessive dependency, right? And exploitation. And this, we see often nowadays, right? So, sometimes we hear the closer, the better. I mean, in a relationship. That's only true between us and God, because He is the perfect being. Other than that, it's not always true. The closer the better between two spouses, obviously, is true, right? Between brothers and sisters, as long as the relationship is healthy. But let's imagine this. Let's imagine I'm a broken person. I'm in need, right? I can't stand to be anxious right now. Like, I have so much to deal with. And then I have this friend. Oh, we've been friends for 10 years, right? But this friend, the way of him, like, the way he deals with me, causes me, in me, so much anxiety. And I can't take it, I'm like, I'm like already there. This is not a healthy relationship. This is not the closer the better. This does not mean that I shouldn't love him. I'm not saying that, obviously, this is very obvious, right? But sometimes we have these relationships that are actually destroying us rather than helping us. And in that case, it's much better to love the person from far rather than hating him, not being able to stand him from close. And this, before deciding to do that, I would definitely talk to have a confession because sometimes it's just us being with the lion. You know, he just told me something once and I just want to cut him off. That's not how it works. If this is how it worked, it would take a couple of months or a couple of years of becoming an individual, not a person. Because I'll be cutting off everybody that I know because there's nobody that's perfect, right? So that's not what I'm saying. But when I have specific needs and I have unhealthy relationships that exploit me, this is an exception, right? But definitely seek counsel for this, right? Healthy relationship means that I have to be open to others. I have to be a Trinitarian being. I have to be a person, right? I have to trust, but not trust everyone. Sometimes you feel or you see people messing, you can, you can meet someone for two weeks, and after two weeks, like you're spitting out all your secrets to that person. Like, what are you doing? Like, it doesn't make sense, right? Or even worse, sometimes it's on Facebook. Like, like what, what are you doing that for? No, 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 that's not how it works. You need to confine in someone that you trust. 
Trust is gained. Trust is built. It's not very emotionally smart to see some guy for the first time tell him all my secrets, and then he exposes them to someone, and then obviously I'm going to be completely broken down. But it's my, my fault. I don't even know who that guy is. Right? So we're not really managing our emotions very well, right? In this day and time. So I need to trust, and trust is gain and not everyone. And then if I am a Trinitarian being, I communicate. And I definitely encourage face to face. Because it's incarnational. Like, it would be very different if I'm giving you this to topic on Skype. That it just would not be the same. When you talk to your friend on the phone, Versus face to face, it's not the same. When you text, it's not the same. This is not how we're meant to communicate. It's fine, it's useful, we can use it, right? But especially in important circumstances, we need to increase the face to face. And as much as possible, we should. I have a friend actually, it was very nice. So I texted him once, texted me again, texted him again, then he called me. I'm like, hi Mike, how are you? He's like, yeah, I'm sorry. When, when the text goes beyond two texts, I just pick up the phone and call. Awesome, it's great. He's thinking correctly, right? That's how it should be, right? And we need to meet with each other more often. The problem is today, it's very easy if I'm angry against someone, I send a text. I hate you. <laughs> Which did see me was unacceptable, okay? That's great. But, and I'm sure it did some sort of help, okay? I'm not going to deny that. But I think it's much, much, much better and smarter and wiser and beneficial if you. Ask him to meet and you talk things through, right? It's very different. Sometimes people go to a point that they put on Facebook indirect messages to someone, but it's on public. It's like, like I don't get that. So it's like they, they put in sentences that only this one person that they dislike should be understanding, but everyone else reads and you don't understand what he's saying. What the heck is this? Which we're like, we were not here, we're not here. And because we're not here, it causes all this distress. That's not how we're meant to function, right? Confession to priest, like, if you think about everything I've said about healthy relationships, right? And you talk about confession to a priest. You start with a priest, and I, I like when people come back. So if I have someone new in confession, a few people would come and say, you know what, Abuna, I have something big in my life, but I'm not ready to say it right now, but I'll just have a normal confession. I tell him, yeah, I accept that very much, right? I understand that fully. Because you need, or I need to gain your trust. Like, you don't know me yet, and that's fine, it's not because I'm worried back that I'm a saint, obviously not, right? So you need to know who I am, how I think, if you feel comfortable, and so on, right? And then, bit by bit, you start revealing the hurtful things, the wounds that are inside of you. But once I gain that trust, and I know that it's confidential. And I know that Abuna loves me and likes me, right? Regardless of what I do, this is how it is. There's not a priest that hates a sinner. It's the opposite, right? When someone comes repentant, you love him. It's automatic. It's reconciliation. Like, it's automatic. It's in you, right? You're happy. This is great. This is awesome. Right? Continue like that. This is how it is. It actually builds your relationship. It doesn't destroy it. You think about this especially positively, right? So you learn to trust him, right? Until you're able to divulge your secrets. But also look and understand, since God designed us, and he knows how we are wired, right? So he gives us his presence within the priest in confession. It doesn't say, no, just confess to me in the room on your own. It's fine. That's not how he did it. That's not how he designed it. Because he knows that we have a need for this, right? And if even scientifically, I was reading, um, there's, I forgot the name, you know when you put like things on your fingers, kind of, and they, they measure the extent of the electricity? Huh? Yeah, something like that, That's not, that wasn't the name I found, but anyway, so they, they have this test, I think it's transcript, where they test or the the uh, value or rate? <coughs> yeah, the right sensors. I just forgot the actual name that I read. It does not. Uh, so at the end, the objective is that they actually uh, rate or see or measure, right, the value of electricity flowing in your skin, right? 
and that has to do with the in or the stimuli image, right? So what they found out is that when a person, so the more stimuli, the more you're anxious in this case, right? So they found out that the person that would divulge his secrets to someone, right? After him saying <coughs> the secrets, the stimuli level in his skin is lower. He's less anxious. And this was compared to if he just divulges normal stuff. Yeah, I ate bacon today, right? Versus like, I killed someone, like, whatever. Like, you understand what I'm saying? So these two in comparison, they found that when he truly, sincerely, the person confesses things that are deep down within, the level of anxiety goes down, right? Which makes sense. So if you think about confession in that understanding, you can understand why God is doing all these things. Because he's the one that created us, yes? Isn't that the same thing as people thinking a burden or a weight on your shoulder? So basically, that's similar to the same, if you tell somebody something, you're not carrying the burden the way on your own, somebody else knows it, and you feel more relaxed because somebody Absolutely. understands you. Absolutely. Especially in confession, when you come and you confess a sin, and you feel this liberation. It's very common, right? It's very common when there's true repentance. Right? If I'm just saying stuff, you're probably going to leave confession maybe the same, I don't know, God knows, right? But you definitely won't have the sense of relief because internally you haven't really repented. Right? I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, so let's say that there's a person that gets too close to another person and then um, maybe to the point that it's hurtful or like unhealthy relationship or abusive. Um, and then they distance themselves from that abusive relationship, but only to get too close to somebody else. Um, what advice do you have to give to a person in order to sort of break that cycle of unhealthy, close relationships? I think, I mean, if, if the person has no help, are you talking about a person that is sick, in need of something, or? No, like, I mean, I guess somebody that's maybe like finding that they have dependencies on, on somebody else, or like, uh, and then they break that independency, but they don't find dependence on God. They find it, they keep finding it somewhere else. Yeah, but that doesn't solve the problem, right? right. So, again, it go, if the foundation of this is the understanding of self. So, I have value because I'm created in God's image, so because of God, and in myself, in my persona, right? And if I don't get to that, I will never be healed. I'm going to jump from one person to another, right? And that's why you see that people like bounce back, right? So I, I have a relationship that breaks. <coughs> so then often people just bounce back to another person, right? Called it a rebound, right? So why is this happening? Is because these people are broken and they're not solid enough, right? So it's normal that we are almost emotionally in distress, but it doesn't help at all, right? I need to heal the wound. It's always about healing the wound before moving forward. When I heal the wound, I know I am, I am solid, I have a will, I am confident. Then I choose to empty myself, I choose to love others, I choose to have a relationship with others. And then the relationships are sound. Because often the problem is in me. I'm too dependent on someone, but I'm going to remain dependent on others. I haven't fixed anything, mm -hmm. right? So often if someone rejects me, maybe it's because I'm too needy, right? Or maybe because we're just not meant to, we're not a fit, and that's fine. But if I am a well-balanced person, I won't care. Actually, if I'm a well-balanced well person, I will probably retract myself of our relationship without having issues, right? But again, like I, I would be afraid to know the statistics of how many people know how valuable they truly are, right? I don't think many of us do, because I really think that all, the world is loud and we are just absorbing all these things and they're ingrained in us and, and, and they brainwash us and, and we can't get out of it. But we truly have to make an effort to repent, you know, change our minds, what I'm saying. Okay? And I'm gonna close with you, you wanna add something? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, please. So, um, let's say there's two people, uh, really close friends for X amount of years, and um, I'm going to use I as in one person and they as the other. Um, this friendship, this person, the other person, uh, they develop toxic habits and the relationship becomes a toxic relationship. 
Um, and I guess it's a fair statement to say that toxic people um, rub off their habits on others. So if I'm in a toxic relationship with someone, whether it be family, friends, etc., and I start developing these habits, what do I do as my own person to break those habits so I don't inflict the same damage on another person? So if I'm solid enough, I'll use that answer with like both sides. If I'm solid enough to help this person without the person affecting me, right, which is not what you asked, right? Mm -hmm. But in that case, I would keep up going with that person. But if I'm not qualified to help, I would lead the person to help someone else. I'll be just there as an extra support, right? If I'm not strong enough and I'm being influenced negatively, then no, this can't work. I need to step out of this, definitely. Uh, if the person is, is in need of help, that doesn't change. So I can get someone else that can help him. Now this varies. If it's a friend, right? If it's a connaissance, if it's a spouse, it's very different. If it's a family member, it's different. Which type of family member? So there's not one answer to all of this, right? But generally speaking, this is what needs to be done. And I wouldn't be scared if I had uh, any family. This is pride in a sense, or right? I'm a couple of uh, small G God, right? Well, I'm too independent, right? At least I have that idea, it doesn't mean that I am, right? But I have that idea of pride in me, so I don't need anybody, right? So the understanding of knowing who I am, that I am limited, makes it normal to need. And since it's normal to need, then let me ask. That's the second part. The first part, uh, I think it's also based on how you ask, right? So you might, you know, you just need help, you ask someone. I think the way you ask is very important. So that, listen, I'm very much in need, I'm sorry to bother you, and it's general, right? And I'm just in need of this. It's very different than, you know, trying to invent the story to make things happen in a way that I don't look vulnerable, that he gets things done. I think it's very, very different, right? One is playing with the person, right? The other one, in my opinion, is very fun. Um, I can speak through experience because at some, when I was young, I wasn't wise enough in one uh, of my dealings with actually one of my closest friends where I had an exact problem, right? Where he was doing things that I didn't want to do, right? Uh, and at some point, we, we had nothing in common, so I'm like, why is the relationship going, right? Um, but the way I did it wasn't very wise, but I cut him off. Not in a, in a bad way, right? But I just suddenly stopped hanging out with him without explaining much. This is how you should not do it. I'll give you another example of how it's done. Uh, you guys know Abuna, oh, Abuna Daniel, Abba Moses? He's a tall monk in Texas. He used to be Protestant, American. He became Orthodox, he's Coptic. He's one of the most beautiful monks, right? So he, he went through the same thing, right? Where he says that obviously he, at some point he left Christ altogether. He was Protestant, became some sort of atheist or agnostic. Then found, wanted to find Christ again, but he wanted to find him in the true way. He found the Orthodox Church, but that was the beginning of where he is now. So he had many friends that he couldn't do much with. Right? Um, but he was much wiser, where he would tell them, you know, I don't mind hanging out with you. I don't mind being with you, but doing this. So doing the positive thing. I don't mind being with you, but let me go to school. I don't mind being with you, but I just have a coffee, right? At the mornings. I'm not gonna go clubbing, right? So then in that way, so then the person gets to choose. Well, no, I don't want this is not for me, okay, but it's up to you. So this at this point is that person is taking the step backwards from you. And then you explain, okay, I, I found God, whatever, I wanna work on my relationship with him, my spirituality, so on. Right? So that's the right way of communication, in other words, with all love. Yeah. Did I answer it? Enough? Any other questions?
Can we have any of the servants here? Organizers? 